time somebody will say something that's not that funny, but for you, it, it just rolls you over. You know, just funny to me. Um, I want to start in, in uh, Luke chapter 11, and I, I want to read the, uh, the quote-unquote Lord's Prayer and then kind of point a little bit in the direction where we've been and point a little bit in the direction where we're headed and, uh, and go from there. Um, I, do, I am glad you're here. I know our, our numbers are probably not going to be real strong tonight. I'm encouraged to see a baseball guy here um, this time of year. That's that's good. That, uh, Sam was able to drag off field. I hadn't seen the softball crew yet, so we can give them a hard time. But uh, anyway, do y'all have school tomorrow? No school for y'all either, huh? <laughs> y'all can step late tonight, can't you? Something. There you go. Well, we're off tomorrow too, so hopefully it won't be too bad. Well, um, let's let's get into the word, and then we'll. We'll have a prayer, um, and uh, I want to use Luke chapter 11, because it, it's kind of a launching point from really where I wanted to start when we started talking about the kingdom. And this, this study has kind of grown, at least lately, into a study of the church, and I like that. It's been, it's been good for me. And let me tell you, um, I'd like to state the obvious sometimes. Sometimes I joke with the co- other coaches, I'm the master of the obvious. But uh, where, I, where I am now, where my, my, not my belief, my, where I, what I hold on to now about the kingdom is a little different than when, when we started. You know, I told you that I always kind of focused the kingdom on the church, which I still do. But I, I think I, I didn't have the, the best concept about the church in terms of the universal part of it, and I saw it more from the local standpoint. And I'll, I'll have more to say of that as we kind of start winding this study down. I do anticipate winding this study up here in a, a week or so. So anyway, well, if you would open your Bibles and your minds and your hearts for a minute, and let's talk about uh, some things bigger than school closings and Super Bowls and all that other stuff we're dealing with. All right, Luke 11, verse 2. He said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indeed indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You know, what a great sample of a prayer and so much of the world, and I've, I made this comment two or three times, is, uh, you know, this kingdom is heaven. And uh, I don't think they're right about that. I think this, this kingdom is the church. And uh, the word kingdom is mentioned so often, so many times. And um, so we're doing a study on the church. Now, I, I wanted to uh, uh, start here because this was my diagram. And the young lady is sitting here that kind of, brought this to my attention and I, it made me change my, my thinking and this is how I feel about the kingdom. I feel more that the kingdom is about the church as in the universal church, not just the Judson Road or whatever, that uh, the church. And I got, this, I got this thing right here that looks just like me. I think Donnie and I both agreed how this really uh, looked like Tracy Blankenship. Now he uh, he brought my anyway. I'm not going to say anything else about that. But um, but the church is the church, the whole, all of us collectively, not not individually. And I want to get. I'd like to get there more tonight. But to stay kind of on my track here, we talked about the different churches, and and so many of them. We talked about the universal church last week and that there's only one. We talked, this is one point I wanted to make again tonight. There's so many examples of the church listed in the word church used, and it's talking about the universal church. I will build my church. Um, uh, Paul was ravaging the church. Uh, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, and the head of the body, and so forth. the characteristics of the universal church are, are important. The universal church includes all the saints 
in fellowship with God. The universal church is not a collective work of different churches. And again, I want to add to that a little bit later. We talked about this last week. The work of the local church. We'll focus on that for a little bit. Evangelism, evangelism thank you very much. Uh, edification and benevolence. Now, I, um, the benevolence here, I didn't think I did a very good job last week, so I want to kind of, I want a little sandpaper, and I want to clean it up just a little bit. Um, you know, as the elders and so forth are involved in the benevolence work, and, and I was really good at giving examples of Tracy Blankenship trying to help someone else, but I don't think I did a good enough job talking about how Judson Road has engaged in benevolence. I thought Cody did a really good job Sunday talking about some of that. And one of the things I don't know if you caught that he mentioned is that we do have me not me we have families and people in our congregation that when something arises on a medium-sized level, we we have a lot of individuals that that really step in and do a lot of the benevolent work before it really gets to the the church to write to send money from the church treasury. But the main thing that we want to emphasize is that we can, and we should, that money from the church treasury can and should be used for the needy saints. And I did, I asked Cody to send me a couple of pictures. Oh, here it is. Uh, this was uh, when a couple of years ago, Cody may have to help me, when we sent money for seed there in Zimbabwe. And that was them holding, uh, or not holding, but the sacks of the, the time we sent seed down there. And this is a, a water tank that, uh, uh, for water. And so there's, I just, you, uh, I asked for just a couple of pictures of some samples of, of us and the work we did in Zimbabwe. How many years ago was the hurricane, uh, is it uh, Harvey, how many years ago was that, Dylan? Five? Five years ago, and we sent some money to the church in Vider. Uh, if you remember, the preacher came and spoke to us and so forth. And so I just wanted to do a decent job, a better job, of just making sure we, you, that we understood the work of the church here does include benevolence and uh, that there, there is a, several samples of it. Now let me back up a little bit. Um, we talked about evangelism when we looked at those verses. We talked about edification and I'm really big on the edification uh, on that. As I get older in my age, I, I, I see so much good that happens as a result of you. When I say you, the people in these pews and what they bring to each other in terms of encouragement. You know, you live in tough times and people go through hard times. Um, it's nice to have a church family. It's nice to have people that just check on you. Hey, I hadn't heard from you in a while. Are you good? Or, or, or just a, a text or whatever. But, you know, it's, uh, it is uh, awesome to have such people that uh, you have an interest in. Now, I used this example last week, and I want to emphasize it one more time, because it's a, an experience that you and I can have on a personal level of the universal church. And that is, you know, when you go on that vacation and you, you end up going to church in some place and you don't know anybody and you walk in and they make you feel wonderful. And the singing is awesome or whatever. And you don't know these people from Adam, but you feel a strong bond. Have you felt that before? You have a strong bond with somebody, I don't even know who you are, but you really treat me well. And uh, you, whether you're traveling or you're in a different place, a different land, and I'm sure that's true even if you were to go overseas. You could probably talk to someone who has examples. I've been to, you know, France or some other place and, and there were Christians and it was cool. It was unbelievable. It is, it is refreshing and it is an experience that as far as just that there's there's a lot of, the brotherhood is bigger than sometimes I think we think. Sometimes, and I think I, Tracy Blankenship could be guilty of this, sometimes we see the church just with our 26 people that are here tonight or whatever. You know, we see our own small world, but there is a big world of Christians out there, and there's, a, there's probably a lot more than you think. 
and it is very encouraging. I just kind of wanted to highlight edification. Go ahead, Glenn. Yes. A lot of the Christians go through is kids need that edification because, you know, they're not around many people their age as us. So if, if you haven't been a part of it as a kid, it's, it's a great work. It, it, yeah. And it's hard to find edification that's like that in another arena for our kids. There's not many arenas for our children to deal, get to deal with other Christian children. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's, that's, that's tough. It makes me almost wonder how non-Christians do it because if their only support group is just their immediate family and that's all they've got, it seems pretty limiting. You know, it, uh, when you've got a support group of a, of a church family who will rush to your aid for just nearly at the drop of a hat, so edifying and so encouraging. And uh, anyway, the edification part is, doesn't need to get overlooked. That's, that's so important. And then I mentioned benevolence in the verses in the, in the New Testament about benevolence and the work here. And right now we're focused on the church locally and some of the issues of it. And we're going to expand some of that. I shared those, these pictures with you. Let's talk about the setup, the organization of the church itself. Let's talk about you know, elders and deacons. Let's go to Acts chapter 14, shall we? Acts 14. Oh, well, let me just keep going. Unless my fingers will move. I want to look at these two verses on the elders and deacons, 1423. <clears throat> where it says, um, so when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And then would someone else grab Titus 1, 5? Let me spread this out a little bit and then we'll talk about the limited work. Um, Glenn, can you get snag Titus 1 in verse 5? Um, Sam, would you help me? Acts 20, 28. And... Becca, would you snag 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2? We're going to talk about elders and elders and deacons. We're going to talk both of them, but we're talking about the local church and because we don't want to confuse the local church with the universal church and we want to, where this is really going, I want you to see is the autonomy, the, the independence of it and how really awesome that really is. We read, I read Acts 14, 23. Glenn, you got Titus 1 and verse 5. Okay, so we, there, these towns and these localities were expected to have elders. Uh, Sam, would you take Acts 20, 28? And then Becca, 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2. Now, um, the verses here focus on the structure of these churches in these local, in these different places. The, and I want to just make a comment or two about the role of elders, the roles of elders and deacons, and how they're part of the local church and, and an important role. I have a couple of notes. Allow me to read. Deacons are not overseers, yet are servants. Um, and the basic principle of much is, as much is given, much is required. And this concept is true in everyday life. If you would, go to Matthew chapter, five, chapter 25 and let's look at this parable. Matthew 25. And, and I want you to, as we read this parable, just keep in mind we're talking about elders, but deacons and elders as well. Matthew 25, and, and um, 
I want to pick it up at verse 14. Where, um, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called to his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise he who had received two gained two more. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more uh, besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And then verse 24, Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. And then it goes down from there. You understand and you've read the story before, but think about it from the standpoint of the church in terms of elders and deacons. The concept of to whom more, more is given, more is expected. Um, that concept holds true within the church, but it holds true on my, our football team, on the basketball, the baseball if you have more, if you're able to do more, it's reasonable to expect you to do more. Now then, let's look at the local church. Let's look at us even, you know. Uh, we have people that are master teachers. And I always try to really focus on and put a lot, of, a lot into them for Vacation Bible School. They have talent. And they need, they use, they need to use their talent. And I think every one of us need to look inside at ourselves what gift, what ability, what talents do I have? What do I bring to the church? What does God receive from me? If you are you the one with five talents, should the church expect five from you? If you're the one with two, what's ex you know, we have different abilities. And I see that in the church. I, I see it from the standpoint, it's the reason I've always taught a Bible class. Because I teach for a living, or at least I have. And I understand education a little bit. You know, so if you don't behave, I know how to send you to the principal's office. And, but seriously, I, I, think it's, I think the church has a right to expect me to teach. We, it, we, it does. Now, I'm not the best song leader in the world, but I'll lead singing. I'm not afraid of it. I just, I'm not as comfortable with that. But there's guys and, and people who can lead singing. There's people who can teach classes. There's people, and I, I see the church from the standpoint of these talents. And that's why the, there's some people that are to be elders and some to be deacons and some to be preachers and some to be Bible class teachers and so forth and so on. And I see that. Deacons are indispensable and a blessing to a local church. And in every organization, the organization is only as good as its leadership. Have you ever worked for a bad boss? Let me, I felt, I found this out in, in coaching. And at the end of my career, I worked for a man that I really loved. And he was, a, he was my superintendent. He was, a lot of people worked for him and everybody, everybody talked good about him. But he was, I tell people all the time, he's the best boss I ever had. And because, it, and in the, I'm talking the school business right now, but it, I think it illustrates the point. Where, where I was, we had a really solid school board of good, moral, ethical people, and nobody had any agendas, and they really cared. Then you had that superintendent that I really loved. And then me, I loved it. I flourished. It was a good situation. I was in a good situation. 
Not that the situation before that was bad, but it wasn't as good. No, we're near it. And my point to you, have you ever been part of an organization where it was really good and maybe contrast to that where it wasn't so much? And so uh, the leadership within the local church is set in place for a reason to try to get it where we, to have quality leaders and quality men serving as deacons so that the whole works so efficiently. And it is a divine setup. It's not haphazard. It, the, uh, it's, if you step back and look at it, how wonderful it is, and when you start adding in the qualifications of elders and qualifications of deacons and, you know, and the expectations, not everybody is to teach, and you're held to a higher standard when you do, people accept that responsibility, but it is a gold mine when you have it, and the, the design of it is impressive. Um, I wrote this quote, no, bear with me here. With qualifications necessary to do a job that isn't easy, and often with other headaches and heartaches, why would anyone want to be an elder? Why would anyone want to be a deacon? Why would anyone want to be a preacher? And why would anybody want to teach a, a Bible class? You know, that's really a legit question. But I do have the answer. But I think it's a reasonable question that people would ask, why would anybody want to be an elder? Why would anybody want to live in a glass house? Why would anybody want to open themselves up to criticism? Why would anybody want to preach? And you might make a mistake. You know, I've made mistakes. You might do it, and it's, you know, it's tough. And it's not an easy thing, um, especially what we've been through in the last year or so. And so here's my answer, and, and, I, and I have, don't believe me, I have thought about this. I think you do these things, whether you're talking about being an elder, being a deacon, being a Bible class teacher, or being a preacher, or whatever role that you can serve, a song leader, two reasons. Number one is love. Your love of God and your love of the church. You know, the, one of the criteria for being an elder was you had to desire the position. And I remember thinking that way out when, okay, yeah, but you, but more than the position is the love of the church, and I care about it. You know, and, and I think that's what you need in your elders. They care. They have a love of these people and what they're trying to stand for, what they're trying to do. What a divine, awesome plan that God put in place. Number one is just love. And that's pretty powerful. And number two, I wrote this. What happens if you're void of leadership? If void of leadership, then the unqualified lead and they create problems. It goes back to, has it ever been catastrophic in your workplace or in an organization you're a part of? You know, and, you know, and over the years, I, I've coached some really good football teams and I've coached some that weren't so good. And, you know, one thing that was one of the criteria you always try to have is leadership, you know, with on, on your captains and things where the leadership came from the kids. The good teams had kids lead the team the bad teams had coaches lead the team we you know it's just it, it's different but when you have no leadership nobody wanting to lead it's frustrating it's difficult some of you old guys around here remember the time before we had any elders at all and it took forever to do anything you know and and so I just want to point out the divine design and how awesome it is and to try to generate appreciation for it. N not to pat anyone necessarily on the back, but just to show a realistic picture of what God intended for the church to be. And I just wanted to highlight those things. Um, I don't really have any more notes about that. but. Um, any comments or questions about the divine plan that God has set up for the church? Because I'm about to move to another point. And I, I did want to highlight the, the deacons and the elders and the work of the church and those that do the work, whether the preachers and so forth. All right. I want to change gears on you just a little bit because one thing I, I did want to get into um, was 
this, this idea that churches can in, uh, get too big and, and too much. Um, the local church is divinely and incredibly organized and independent. I want to focus on the independence of the church. Uh, this HOT stands for the Herald of Truth. Are you familiar with the story that occurred in the 50s with the Highland Avenue Church of Christ? For you young po people like me, you know, we might not have heard about some of this stuff. Um, and I know Donnie probably has. He's on up there. And so uh, uh, I'm teasing Donnie. But seriously, I, 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 I did not grow up in the church. Um, you know, I met Kathy uh, when, when uh, I was, I guess, 18 years old or so. And so I'd never heard of the Herald of Truth, never really heard of the high. And so um, basically, I kind of did a little nosing around about the sponsoring church. Why don't churches work together? I mean, to me, isn't that uh, logical? And I mean that quotation marks in a human standpoint, because I think, because I just tried to make the point. We have a divine system and it's really incredibly good. We humans, we, the mankind, we try to outsmart God and we, we can make it better. We're like, uh, who, who had the wife and she didn't conceive and, and then uh, had the maid uh, conceive, help me, Abraham and Sarah. And that whole story, you know, Sarah said, said, let me fix it, you know. Humans, we try to fix the problem and we just muddy up the water. And I want to talk about what the church had a major split way before my time. And some of you, you really young, older people, you probably can remember it a little bit. But it's before most of y'all's time too, I would guess. But it started when churches really started wanting to work together because the, the theory was this. If we work together, we can do more. If we put our money into the television and we get a bunch of churches to do it and we, they bring their money to us and we send it over to the, we can reach thousands more people and bring them to Christ. And after all, isn't that the work of the church? Now again, I'm being them. So, um, it goes back to this. This is back to my, the picture I drew and that the churches are independent. Let me back up. I got ahead of myself. I got a couple of notes here that I want to highlight for just a second. The Herald of Truth. The Highland Avenue Church of Christ wanted to preach in mass media, radio and television. This is the 1950s. It had uh, it has become the work of over 3,000 churches. 1966, the budget of the Herald of Truth was $1,300,000. Uh, it claimed to be an efficient, expedient way to spread the gospel. And my next question in my notes say, says, is it? Is it an efficient and expedient way to spread the gospel? Now, as we look at this, I want you to turn in the New Testament to Acts chapter 15. And let's talk about this for a second. Luke, John, Acts. First of all, any comments about the sponsoring churches and how churches, the theory is out there that churches could work together and reach more people and do more work and more good and convert more people. Any comments about that before we move on? Glenn? Right, and, and where I see the huge danger that, that does seem to be a little bit of common sense is this. What happens if they, all of a sudden they're preaching error? Now they're preaching it. When it's broke, it's broke to more people. If, if we teach error, if one, of the, if the one of these independent churches teaches error, it affects those 100, 200, whatever people that it doesn't affect the whole. The whole is independent and can move forward. We don't have to answer to the Pope or to the, or to the Highland Avenue Church of Christ. We don't have to answer to them. We have to answer to God. But if, if this congregation, us, we go south 
and we get distracted and we pull the whole congregation away, it's just, we just pulled us away. We didn't destroy the universal church. We destroyed our 150 folks, and that's bad enough. But that's one thought about it. But go to Acts 15. I want to pick it up at verse 6. This was this in this issue was thoroughly covered in a situation in the first century. The conflict was over circumcision. What do we do about circumcision? And they met. Uh, there was the, uh, the Jerusalem Council. Now the apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter, and when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledges them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as He did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the necks of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Then all of the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, and with this the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things, known to God from eternity are all his works. I'm at verse 19. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those among the Gentiles who are turning to God but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preached him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was named Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. They wrote this letter and they circulated the letter. And they wrote it to the apostles, the elders, and the brethren. And then, let me, uh, maybe enough to make my point. Um, and then it explains the letter. For time issues, I won't really go too deep into the letter. But they did come together. But these were the apostles. And I think the sponsoring church people think, well, this gives... Uh, opportunity to expand it out to all the churches and it's just the opposite of that what it actually is these uh, these apostles came together wrote a letter for him which there's several letters written but he's but then he tells them to take the letter to the apostles and to the elders and then so it strengthens the fact that these churches were independent did I cover that well enough or, or close any questions about the sponsoring church and all of that stuff, it was a, I, it, it, it's my understanding this was a nightmare in the late 50s and 60s that the sponsoring church idea was, was really deadly and did a lot of damage to a lot of what would have been conservative churches. You older folks, would you concur? Am I hitting it? That's right, that's where that Highland Avenue church is. Yeah. And they, the money still goes through that uh, uh, Church of Christ in Abilene, Texas. Yeah. Well, the point I really wanted to highlight to you is the independence and the divine establishment of the church. And how wonderful it is and how well structured it is. And we don't need to change it. And it has been tried and it's not good. And the Highland Avenue Church, you can have good intentions, but that don't make it right. You know, we can, uh, the, the, uh, uh, let's 
started to say the adoption agency, but the, wasn't there a, a home that I'm, say it again? Bowles home where they, they took in kids. What a great work. But it's not the work of the church. You know, uh, write them a check out of your pocket, you know, to great work. Ab adoptions and children and schools, there are so many people so many things out there that need people. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Oh, really? Uh, but, and and because the states want, or that schools wanting the money from the state. I got you. All right. Wow. Well, and I've learned this the hard way. You, you cannot save every puppy at the pound either. I've learned that the hard way. Y'all saw what Kathy and I tried to do with Kendall that time. You know, it just, we tried and it just, it wasn't going to work. You, you can't, you know, you can do what you can do. But the church needs to stay the church and it needs to focus on preaching and benevolence and edification. And their structure is designed by God. And, uh, all right, whoops, let me go the other way. Here's where we're going. Next week, I want to talk about premillennialism and what it means. And what I learned when I was looking at some of this was this is not, this has some Church of Christ background to it. There's some of the old preachers that held on to this as I was reading about some of this. And uh, so it's not, it's not a non issue within the Church of Christ, especially over the history of, of the church. Uh, and that was surprising to me as I was learning a little bit about premillennialism. Next week we want to talk about that. And then we'll, be, then we'll be winding it down. Where I would like to go next after the kingdom, the, the next phrase that I want to talk about is uh, the gospel the gospel. I want to talk about the gospel, what the, what the word gospel means. And I want to get a better feel for that for myself. And, and as you know, the way I teach, I, I try to study topics that I, I want to know a little more about. I want to brush up my own thinking on some of this stuff. And this kingdom was really strong for uh, a important part of that for me. Any last comments? And we'll, we'll wind it up and we'll bring up the millennial, premillennialism next week. All right. Well, appreciate your commentaries, and we'll we'll go we'll call it a night from there. Y'all stay uh, stay warm tomorrow.